hi 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 welcome to a new life um day today is day 26 and we're looking at chapter 26 okay so we've been off for a little while again as usual quite a lot going on in our life as well so we're gonna go straight into it without wasting any of our time we're reading the book the purpose driven life and we're at day 26 chapter 26 so let's just get straight to it growing through temptation that's what the chapter is called um happy is the man who doesn't give in and do wrong when he is tempted for afterwards he will get as his reward the crown of life that god has promised those who love him and this is james chapter 1 verse 12. so as usual he gives us two verses to look at before we delve further into the chapter so another one says my temptations have been my masters in divinity and that was martin luther king so it's all about temptations this chapter and as usual we always say to you give us a, a quick shout out if you're out there watching and we always thank everyone who's been making it their their business to be part of this whole long journey that we're taking on it's a 40-day journey and today is day 26 so we're gradually getting there um now we are on instagram live but if that does um turn off usually either our phone has given up on something or the network has dropped on us or there's so many reasons or the battery is gone because it's usually a very long one whole hour sometimes so just go onto youtube and follow us world of bread in the 40 day journey um a new life and we have recorded everything is all there so like i always ask people if this is making sense to you please like it share it and subscribe because there's so much more coming your way 26 days down the line we still got so many more to make it 40 days and for me personally a lot has happened it's really really opened my way of seeing life remember last chapter we talked about spirituality and now i absolutely see spirituality in another light is in the light of the life we live the physical life we live now is not what everything is there's a deeper person inside us the real us that's inside so everything that's on the outer is a super superficial part of us and that's the part that dies away that's the part that becomes dust to dust that's the part that when we're gone um it is no longer there and that's the part nobody sees but somehow we still have to respect this part of us because without this part of us we will not be here physically on this earth the minute this part of us disappears the spirit goes and that's the eternal life that's the part that we don't know where it goes and that's the part that god really wants us to mature that's the part that needs to grow and that's the part this book is really focusing on guiding us on how to look at it and how to work with it and how to guide it so it's really exciting for me i'm 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 really thrilled and happy that god directed me to look at this book and for me it's really made a huge change we still haven't finished but i feel a lot lighter about life so every temptation is an opportunity to do good that's what is reminding us that every time we're tempted we're tempted it is an opportunity for us to do something good out of it on the part of spiritual maturity remember i just men mentioned spiritual maturity which is where we're aiming for even temptation becomes a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block when you realize that it is just as much an occasion to do the right thing as it is to do the wrong thing so every time we we tempted is a it's it's an opportunity for us either it will take us to the right side or it's going to take us to the left side which is is that going to bring the good out of us or it's going to bring the bad out of us so temptation simply provides the choice so that's the two choices is it the good or the bad but this is where you're going to get a lot of guidance on how to deal with temptation so while temptation is Satan's primary weapon to destroy us, God wants to use it to develop us. So you've heard of Satan and how the world got, you know, we call it the fallen world, Adam and Eve and all of that. We were clearly told and we have been, you know, we've understood it to mean that Satan came into, into their life when they had this perfect life and destroyed everything through temptation. And so t Satan's job or devil, I prefer to just say devil, the devil's job is always to tempt us to go the wrong way and so he's reminding us here in this book that it is the devil's job 
to tempt us to destroy the aim his primary aim when it when it tempts us is to destroy us but god is also guiding us through that opportunity to use it to strengthen us so instead of us to be destroyed by satan through temptation he actually wants us to be smart enough to choose the other way where he's not expecting us to, to choose and then get stronger in the process and so every time we choose to do good instead of bad we are growing in the character of christ so we begin to to, to pick up those beautiful, beautiful habits that Jesus Christ had because he was smart and stronger than Satan in every way by overcoming all the temptations that came his way. And so to understand this, we must first understand the character, the character qualities of Jesus Christ. So he wants us to understand these qualities that Jesus had that God really hopes for us to achieve. One of the most concise description of his character is the fruit of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit is one of the most important characters that came out of Jesus and he starts to break them down. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruits in us. So again, Holy Spirit is what guides us every day and it's the Holy Spirit that's going to put those, um, those fruits into our life. And what are these fruits? These fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So these are the fruits that Jesus had and these are the fruits that God is wanting us to develop here on earth as humans. These nine qualities are an expansion of the great commandments. Remember the ten commandments where, Jesus, where God gave us through Moses, he gave us so many things that don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. He was guiding us. I would rather call them the, the qualities that or the, the, the commandments, the things that actually was meant to lead us through life. It's like saying the instruction manual. You know when you have a manual, when you buy a microwave or buy a cow, but, and it says this is how you handle it. Those, the Ten Commandments was supposed to be the manual that was supposed to guide us through life. But did we listen to it? That's where the problem came in. So these nine qualities, they are an expansion of these great commandments, these nine things we've mentioned, and they portray a beautiful description of Jesus Christ. These nine fruits portray who Jesus Christ was or is. Jesus is perfect love. Is. Remember? Is. He lives forever. Jesus is perfect love. Jesus is joy. He is peace. He is patience and all the other fruits that were embodied in a single person. All the fruits we mentioned were all embodied in Jesus Christ. To have the fruit of the Spirit is to be like Jesus Christ. So to have these nine fruits in us, we are now gradually becoming like Jesus. How then does the Holy Spirit produce these nine fruits in our life? That's the next big, big question. So now you heard about these fruits. Now you're excited. Now you wish you have these fruits in your life. How do we get it? Does he create them instantly? Will you wake up one day and be suddenly filled with these characteristics fully developed? Will you wake up one bright morning and go, Oh my goodness, look at me. I'm not filled up with these nine fruits. God, he says, no, you're not going to find that happening. He says, fruits always matures and ripen slowly. So when you know of a tree, a mango tree, an apple tree, um, a strawberry, you know there's also seasons for them. So it takes time for these fruits to grow and ripen. So that's what he's telling us, that these nine fruits, we gradually get into us. And so God develops the fruit of the Spirit in our lives by allowing us to experience circumstances in which we are tempted. To express the exact opposite quality so how do these fruits come into our life now he's given us this opportunity through temptation so that when these fruits when this temptation comes we then take on the opposite side of what the temptation is going to make us become and then the fruit develops in us so Character development is all, always involves a choice and temptation provides the opportunity. So you see how it's arranged it. For us to pick up a character, it is a choice. And temptation gives us that opportunity to pick up that choice. The choice where something has to be different instead of the other. And you're going to find that in life we have two major big choices, like those voices in our head. The one that pushes us to do bad and the one that pushes us to do good. And so, for instance, God teaches us love by putting some unlovely, unlovely people around us. So now look at the nine fruits. 
So it's going to give us an opportunity to develop the nine, these nine fruits. So a good example is love. How many people do you love? How do you know you love them? He said, you will know you love people when he has put unlovely people around you. So you are now forced to have the choice of loving them even, because, even though they are extremely unlovely. It takes no character to love people who are lovely and loving to you. So remember, we're trying to build character. So if you have people around you that are loving and kind and beautiful and gorgeous, it's only normal for you to love them back. That's just the way it is. But God teaches us real joy in the midst of sorrow when we turn to him. He says it takes no character to love people who are lovely and loving to you. So that's the example. We cannot say we love people if these people are already loving and kind to us. God also will be teaching us real joy in the midst of sorrow. So when we have sorrow coming our way and we're strong enough to step out of the sorrow and have joy then we're picking up the character of joy unhappiness will depend on an external circumstances but joy is based on our relationship with god so god develops real peace within us not by making things go the way we planned but by aligning times aligning times of chaos and confusion so again we are now being taught how we can develop peace it's not because everything around us is calm. So if that happens, that will naturally be peaceful. But he gives us so much chaos around our lives. So that in the midst of the chaos, we should be strong enough to pick up calmness. That's how calmness becomes. That's how joy and happiness will come into our life. So anyone can be peaceful watching a beautiful sunset or relaxing on vacation. So if the environment around you is all calm and peaceful, you will be naturally calm and peaceful. You haven't taken any extra effort to create that atmosphere. But if everything around you was chaotic, chaotic and, you know, noisy and loud, and you found calmness in all of that chaos, that's when you have picked the character of calmness. So we learn real peace by choosing to trust God in circumstances in which we are tempted to worry or be afraid. So now circumstances around you are so chaotic and so stressful and so so fearful you're so worried and you want to you want to give up but then you suddenly realize that i have a god and he's in control and he knows what he's doing and you're calm and you're at peace and you trust him now that's when you develop that character so likewise patience is developed in circumstances in which we are forced to wait and are tempted to be angry to have a short fuse so again if we were expecting a quick result out of something i want this to happen now and i want this you know as humans we've lined it out how it's meant to be and it's not happening that way but we're still relaxed and we're not cleaning ourselves over it that's how we have picked up the character of patience because we're trusting god to take control of it so god uses the opposite situation of each fruit to allow allow us a choice that makes a lot of sense. So if you want to pick up the character of each of these fruits, it is the opposite that will come into your life. And when that comes and you overcome it, then you are beginning to grow in that particular fruit. Okay. God uses, we've said that one, you can't claim to be good if you've never been tempted to be bad. So remember the whole idea of this is opposites and opposites and opposites. So if you say you're good, that means you've actually had the opportunity to be bad and you chose to be good. You can't claim to be faithful if you've never had the opportunity to be unfaithful. So you see how opposites are coming into the life. If you, if you claim to be joyful and you have never had the situation to be angry and upset and sad, then you cannot say you're joyful. You can't say you're calm if everything around you is calm. You have to have the opposite of it for you to be stronger to achieve the other side of it and then that means you picked up that character and you know i gave an example um i was chatting with someone the other day and i gave an example of a, a, a you know someone i know this is way back in nigeria he he drives me around when i'm in the country and whenever he sees traffic jam he gets crazy now 
he cannot say to himself that he's a calm person if he cannot handle that kind of situation. So that's what this is. When you are actually forced to deal with things that you would normally not be happy about, but you overcome it and take it very slowly and calmly without blowing your fuse according to what he said, then you have picked up that habit. You have created that character. So integrity is built by defeating the temptation to be dishonest. You know when we say he has integrity? He's got something about him that you can rely on him. You can trust what he says. You can, but if you, if you have the opportunity to be dishonest and you choose to be honest, that's integrity. Humility grows when we refuse to be prideful and endurance develops every time we reject the temptation to give up. So humility, are you humble? Yes, but the opportunity to be prideful was there and you did not choose it. So that makes you a humble person. And the opportunity to to not give up or to give up has there, you know, has come into your life, is staring you in the face, but you chose not to give up. That's endurance. So all these nine fruits will come into your life. All the opportunities are there in your life. But are you choosing them? That's the question he's asking us. So every time we reject a temptation, we become spiritually mature, like Jesus. So every time these opportunities come into our life to take the opposite and just follow the expectation and we don't take it then we are gradually growing in character like jesus christ did and now he begins to tell us how temptation works he says it helps to know that satan is entirely predictable so this is a great news for us satan or devil the devil is purely predictable he, we can anticipate when he's coming and what he wants to do so he has been using and will continue to use the same strategy and all tricks since creation. He's been using the same strategies since creation. The same way he tempted Adam and Eve is the same way he's still tempting people till today. And all temptations follow the same pattern. So now he's gradually reminding us how he wants us to grow. Because the temptations that come our way, they follow the same pattern. So if we are strong enough to understand them when they're coming, we will overcome them and then we will be able to build those fruits that we're looking for. The characters that make us stand out and become slowly like Jesus. And he says, that's why Paul said, we are very familiar with his evil schemes. So Paul clearly wrote, we should be familiar by now with the way he plans and organizes himself. He said, from the Bible we know that temptation follows a four step process which Satan used on Adam and Eve and on Jesus as well. So from the Bible, we know that the temptations that come our way constantly follow a first step and it's going to give us this first step. Now, step one, the devil identifies a desire inside us. So you see how he's beginning to guide, and, you know, guide us slowly to understand what's going on in this very present world we're living in. He starts by knowing a desire in us. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we want to do. What we wish for, I wish I could have that. I wish I could be here. I wish I could get this. I wish this is happening. So you've got that wish coming on in your mind. It may be a sinful, a sinful desire. That desire may just not be right. You know, like, how do I put it? Let's start with, let's say a man sees a very beautiful woman who's in her own way exposes every part of her body that's really not meant to have been exposed. And the man is suddenly looking at her with, a desire in his mind I wish I could be with that woman so that's the desire now the devil picks up on that desire because you've expressed it is a desire you have in your mind so eg to get revenge he gave another he gave his own example here to get a revenge someone has upset you so much someone has done something that's really really hurtful and in your mind you've created that desire I am gonna get that person so it's a desire now or to control others you know what i really want to make sure i control everybody around me that's my desire now so you've expressed the desire is there in your mind it could also be a legitimate normal desire this desire could also be something normal i wish i could pass my exams or i wish i could come tops in the class so you have a desire that you have expressed in your mind now temptation starts when Satan suggests 
with a simple thought in your mind where it all starts so this mind is where this whole thing starts so you have this desire in your mind and satan comes and adds his own suggestion to it that you give in to evil desire or that you fulfill a legitimate desire in a wrong way or at the wrong time so it now comes to you and is looking at how you can do this thing the wrong way this desire that you've already expressed he's trying to now direct you to do it the wrong way or at the wrong time so always be aware of shortcuts because what's happening is you know you want to do something and I, I can relate to let's say a quick example that i can think of right now you are in university you want to pass your exams you say you want to get the best grades satan has picked up on that that desire you want to pass with first class or you know be the first in your class or whatever what does he do he teaches you he tells you why don't you go and play you know go and hang around with the teachers or go and befriend one of the teachers go, go find out about what's happening in the in the office and see how you could you know get access to that result that exam paper before everybody else so that's a shortcut because you could have taken the proper course, which is take time and read properly and hope that everything you read is going to come out in your exam so that you can scale it through with a, a plus or whatever but no it tells you how about you look at it this way what if you do this and what if you do that so what it does what the devil does is look at a short way of getting that result for you and naturally that short way will not be the right way so that's the right or wrong way now so there are often temptations shortcuts are often temptations he tells us satan whispers in our ears you deserve it so whatever this thing was is, is agreeing with you that yes is your right you should have it you should have it now it will be exciting it will be comforting it will make you feel better so he's encouraging this desire that you've expressed he's actually you know like kind of like supporting you on willing you on being there for you and telling you yes it is your right to get this thing you deserve to be this person and so we think temptation lies around us no it doesn't lie we're starting we initiate it by expressing a desire i want to be rich aha uh -huh. for instance in africa in nigeria in particular you've expressed this desire i want to be rich ah i'll tell you what you can do how about you go and kill xyz number of people and then join some occultic group and then what if you go and um uh, uh, kidnap some people and and ask for ransom so these are that's not the, the devil giving you thoughts on how to achieve your dream of being rich quick quickly instead of guiding you how about you walk this way and walk hard and do this and do that no it just wants you to get shortcut and get the answers right now so it says we think temptations lies around us but god says it begins within us so this is where i, I remind us we are an inside job because everything that we are starts from inside so these temptations don't lie around and hang around waiting for you to drop in on it it is something you actually thought about it's a wish that you have and then we fall prey because the devil now comes and tells us whisper shortcuts about how to achieve it if we did not have the internal desire the temptation could not have attracted us simple if we had not wish we were rich quick if we had not wish we passed our exam so 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 excitingly if we had not wish we owned that particular you know whatever it is it always starts within us so temptations always start in our mind not in circumstances it's not the circumstance that creates the temptation it's our mind that creates it jesus said for from within out of a person's heart from within out of our heart come evil thoughts so from inside our heart are these evil thoughts coming out sexual immorality theft murder adultery greed wickedness deceit eagerness for lustful pleasures envy slander pride and foolishness you see how the list goes on all of these things come from inside our heart and that's why 
why it's such a tough job to be able to overcome these things because they are deep inside us all these all these vile things come from within us and James tells us that there is a whole army of evil desires within us that is so so scary because people think that Satan walks outside it's chasing us from outside and it was that person's fault it was that we always look for who to point at but no the desire always comes from inside us it starts from us and now, now number two step two he says doubt doubt is the next step that satan uses satan tries to get us to doubt what god has said about sin so now we've said we want to pass these exams and then maybe um, a passage comes to our, our, our mind that, you know, you have to walk. When you walk, you receive. If you seek, you find. If you, if you, if you, you know, um, you reap what you sow, which is go and, go and read and you'll get results out of it. So the Bible is telling us things that will help guide us. But no, Satan says, oh, please, forget all that thing. You've heard it before. And everybody who's had it, had it, it work for them. You're just listening to nonsense. It's not going to work. And so now it's created doubt in our head, already in our, in our heart. Now we're in doubt. We don't believe it anymore. Is, this, is it really wrong? Now it's reminding us. What if you decided to, you know, maybe kidnap somebody? Is it really wrong? After all, people are doing it. Did God really say not to do it? Is my is asking you now. Didn't God mean this prohibition for someone else or some other time? So he's, he's putting all these doubts in your head. Did God really say you cannot be rich? And I know there are times too that he will even be quoting passages for you. Oh, was it not this passage that said X, Y, Z? So doesn't God want me to be happy? He's asking you now, doesn't God want you to be happy? Why are you taking this as something wrong? There's nothing wrong with what you're going to do. The Bible wants, wants us. We should watch out. We should watch out. Don't let evil thoughts or doubts make any of us turn from the living God. We should not listen to these thoughts. All these negative thoughts, we should not listen to them. Step three is deception. Satan is incapable of telling the truth and is called the father of lies. So all he is great at is to tell us lies. Anything he tells you will be untrue or just half true. Satan offers his life to replace what God has already said in his word. Satan says, you will not die. So no, no, he says to you, if you commit a crime, so what? You're not going to die. And that's why you hear lots of people don't believe in God. Because they say, oh, please. So when you die, what happens? And then this happens. And then that, you, it builds a lot of nonsense in our head. You will be wiser like God. That's what happened to Satan himself. Because it was from his greed of wanting to be as wise as God that he became a fallen angel. You can't get you can't get away with it. So he's telling you, it's like people who steal. When we go and steal, we think, oh, but it's only one little thing. If I take it, who's going to notice? Nobody's going to notice anyway. And that's how you get tempted. He said, no one will ever know. That's him speaking to you in your head. It will, so, it, it will solve your problem. Look, you're still sitting and they're being stupid. If you do that thing, that problem, that design, you will disappear. Your answers will be there. Besides, everyone is doing it. It is only a little sin. It's a tiny little thing. Who's going to notice? And, and, you know, like, for example, let's give another example. When people, especially in adultery situations, so a man and a woman starts hanging out with other women. Or a woman hangs out with other men. And in her head she's thinking, but so it's just me and him. Who's ever going to notice that I went out with somebody else? Oh, it's only a little thing. It doesn't matter. It's only a tiny thing. You know, so that's your voice talking to you. That's the devil speaking to you. My wife's never going to know. How is she going to know? Nobody's going to tell. I won't tell. And I'm sure this person won't tell. And so it carries on until you get into the act, until you've done it, and then trouble starts to follow. Because the devil had lied to you. It made you feel like your desire, you're going to be so happy after you've done what you wanted to do. But what comes out of it is never happiness. So it says, but it will eventually, eventually, 
Now he says, but a little sin is like being a little pregnant. <laughs> That's a really good one. Being a little pregnant. You know what? Pregnancy is obviously, you start slowly. And so you get pregnant and slowly, slowly it, start, it starts to grow. He says it will eventually show itself. The pregnancy will eventually get to nine months and show itself. So you may think it was such a little thing you were doing, it will build up and become something big eventually. Step four, disobedience. So you finally act on the thought you're being toying with within your mind. So that thought you've been toying with, thinking about, thinking about that desire. Now, Satan has guided you to the point now you're acting on it. What began as an idea gets birthed into behavior. So it becomes an action. It becomes something you're now beginning to do. Because why? what happens is you did it the first time. No one caught you. You carry on. You do it again. You do it again. And now it's become a part of you. It's become a habit. He said you give in to whatever got your attention. So that attention, that, that thing that created that desire, you are now giving into it. You believe Satan's lies and you fall into the trap that James warns us about. He said, we are tempted when we are drawn away and trapped by our own desires. So it's our desires that creates that trap. That becomes this habit that we formed. Then our evil desires conceive and give birth to sin and sin. When it is full grown, gives birth to that. So it starts slowly. It starts slowly. Eventually, it becomes that. And I remember, I remember one of the um, videos I, I was watching on YouTube, and, and the man said when he was a child, and his mom kept telling him, "Don't do X Y Z, you will die. Don't do X Y Z, you will die." And so he kept wondering, what did mom mean when she said you will die? And so he did it the first time and he did not die and said, oh my goodness, mom was lying. I'm not dead. Look at me. I'm still alive. But eventually he caught up with it because he was not happy. So he understood that death does not necessarily mean physically dying. It means unhappiness. It, it starts to lead to sadness. Things start to follow it up and follow it up and follow it up. And that's why James is warning us here. Then our evil desires conceived and uh, conceived. And give birth to sin. So from this desire that we have that Satan has guided to be bad becomes sin. And when we sin and the sin has become full grown, we die. Unhappiness follows. So he's guiding us. Do not be deceived, my dear friends. Do not be deceived. So those are the four steps that follow when we carry on with sin. Those are the four steps that follow that evil thing called temptation. So overcoming temptation is the next stage. You see, understanding how temptation works is in itself helpful. But there are specific steps we need to take in order to overcome it. So number one, we should refuse to be intimidated. Refuse to be intimidated. Many Christians are frightened and demoralized by tempting thoughts. Feeling quietly, uh, feeling guilty that they aren't beyond temptation. So most of us think that, oh my goodness, why am I not above temptation? Why am I, why am I so weak to be tempted? So they feel ashamed just for being tempted, just to have experienced that that voice in your head telling you, why don't you do this instead of doing that? You feel ashamed. You feel angry. This is a misunderstanding of maturity. Remember, we're trying to mature as spiritual beings. We're trying to go away from this physical being which allows us to think about all these various things and start thinking further into who we really are inside. And so, temptation is not a bad thing in itself. It says it's, it is a misunderstanding for us to imagine that we shouldn't be tempted. We will never outgrow temptation. No matter how old you are, you're not meant to outgrow temptation. In one sense, we can consider temptation a compliment. So in one sense, temptation is good. Satan does not have to tempt those who are already doing his evil will. They are already his. So imagine someone who's already a bad person, already known for, for you know, this criminal. All he does is criminal actions. For him, he doesn't need temptation. That's just him. 
it's his natural way of doing things now but now for you to be tempted that means you you have not been already in satan's gang you have not been on his side you haven't been doing what he wants so that's why he constantly follows you with it and so temptation is a sign that devil the devil hates you so when you whenever you feel yourself being tempted that means the devil is looking for you he wants something from you. he wants you to be one of his followers because he cannot be tempting people who are already following him anyway and so it's not a sign of weakness or worldliness so lots of us are thinking for, for us to be tempted that means oh my goodness we have done something really bad says so no it just means that you are really strong and now the devil wants to get you so now this is where we start to learn letters, lessons it is also a normal part of being human living in a fallen world so we are human and temptations is just part of being in this world right now because we know what we've been told the world has fallen it fell from Adam and Eve this is not how God meant it to be and that's why when lots of people always query if there's really a God why is this happening why is that happening it's all part of growing up it's all part of spiritually maturing and so don't be surprised or discouraged by it be realistic about the inevitability of temptation so we should just be realistic we should be strong enough to understand it and that's why he's given us those steps to understand when these things are about to happen because from what he said it takes the same pattern all the time there are no times it changes it it starts with your desire so now you have to be watchful of what your desires are and how you are going to handle it when the voices come and say why don't you get it quicker instead of waiting for a longer time so remember the endurance thing is looking for shortcuts it doesn't want you to wait it doesn't want you to be patient so remember the the fruits of those fruits that we're supposed to be looking for they are meant to be the ones that takes the normal course so be realistic about the inevitability of temptation you will never be able to avoid it completely temptation will always come and so the bible says when you're tempted not if the bible clearly says that when we are tempted not if we're tempted Paul advises, remember that the temptations that come into your life are not different from what others have experienced. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted, yet he never sinned. So you see that? That just, that just does it for me. So for all of us here to think that temptations oh yeah we are above it is never going to happen to us there's there's a part in one of the part in the chapters we read and it say we lie when we say our life is perfect then we lie because nobody's life is perfect nobody's life has ever been perfect except the life of jesus and yet the most perfect man who walked the earth also got tempted so that just tells you that none of us are going to scale through this life without experiencing it and that's why this is preparing you from whenever it comes to be strong enough to deal with it so temptation only becomes a sin when you give into it jesus was tempted but yet he did not sin so temptation is a sin when we give in to it martin luther said you cannot keep birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest in your head and that was his way of looking at sin or temptation he said you cannot keep the bird you know how birds fly and they go in different directions he says the only time you know you have a problem is when you actually allow them to come and build a nest in your head so that's the same thing temptation will always flow through our mind but it will only make make sense so we can only fall prey to it when it actually gets a stronghold in our mind and we actually act on what has happened in our mind because remember like i keep saying to friends now i live i live two times every action I was thinking in my head through clear it out and tell myself how I'm going to carry on this action and then I physically take it into action to become life. That's 
the same thing with temptation. You could have had all that discussion in your head, all that argument, all that fight with devil. Why don't you take the shortcut? Why don't you do it this way? Why don't you say, get, Jesus said, get deep behind me, Satan. I don't want to hear your voice. You're just messing around with my head. And so, the, the, the mental has happened and the physical never happened. So, how can you possibly be, be have created sin or have become a sinner in that particular aspect? Because it only happened in your head and you never put it into action. And so, that's why it says all of us will be tempted. But it's only when we put it into action that it becomes a sin. And so temptation it becomes a sin when you give in to it. Martin Luther said, we kept that one. You cannot keep the devil from suggesting thoughts to you, but you can choose not to dwell or act on them. So the thoughts will always come into your head. But as long as you don't act on them, you are fine. For example, many people don't know the difference between physical attraction or sexual arousal and lust. They are not the same. This is what he's telling us. Most people don't understand the difference between physical attraction, physically being attracted to somebody, or sexual arousal or lust. He said, God made every one of us a sexual being. And that is good. Attraction and arousal are the natural spontaneous God-given responses to physical beauty. So you look at somebody and go, oh wow, she's so beautiful. And you get aroused. That's because you're human, you're natural. God gave us that, all of us. But lust is deliberate act of win. Lust is when you, oh, I want, I want to touch that. I want to reach her. I want to be part of her. I want to get there. That becomes a will. You actually want to put that, in, that thought in your head into action. Lust is a choice to commit in your mind that you like to do with your body. So in your mind, you've given a yes, I am in there. Now your body is going to follow it. You can be attracted or even aroused without choosing to sin by lusting. So lust is the sin itself because now you're actually taking the physical action of being part of what your head was thinking about. Many people, especially Christian men, feel guilty that their God-given hormones are working. So he's giving the example that Christian men sometimes, when they see beautiful women, they go, oh, I wish I knew, or oh, I wish I could be part of her. And then they feel, they feel really guilty that something in their body felt alive when they saw someone that's beautiful. You see, when they automatically notice an attractive woman, they assume it is lost and feel ashamed and condemned. So they condemn themselves because they just felt something when they saw this physically attractive. Because that's just the way God made us. We are physically attracted to each other sometimes. But attraction is not lost until you begin to dwell on it. So when you start dwelling on this thought in your head, you are gradually getting there. Actually, the closer we grow to God, the more Satan will try to tempt us. So the more you are more of a moral person, the more the devil will try to tempt you constantly. The moment you become God's child, Satan, like, like a mobster, a mobster hitman, puts you on a contract. So the minute you start becoming more and more morally ready, morally uh, 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 acceptable to God, you're beginning to create that Christ-like behavior, Satan goes, ah, that one is on my hit list. I want to prove that God wrong, that this person is not going to withstand him or be strong enough to follow him. You are his, his enemy and he's plotting your downfall. So Satan is constantly, he's not ready to pull you down. Sometimes while you are praying, Satan will suggest a bizarre. So sometimes you're praying, what happens? Satan suggests something evil into your head just to distract you. You're praying, you're trying to speak to God and, you know, think of good thoughts. But suddenly, boom, an idea hits your head and now it's a negative idea. Don't be alarmed or ashamed by this, but not that Satan fears your prayers and will try anything to stop you. So whenever you're praying and you find yourself being distracted, that Satan struggling to stop you from doing that. But why? Because he's afraid of you. He doesn't want you to go, become good. He doesn't want you to have good things. The whole idea of Satan on this earth, which we all know about, is to destroy the world. It's not to bring good to the world. And if a few people are constantly aiming for the good of the world, Satan is not happy. He just wants to gather as many disciples.
disciples as possible to constantly. And that's why you see the world constantly falling apart. And what I say to people is, even if it takes one or two or three people to be thinking of good things to do, God will work with those people. Don't be alarmed or ashamed by this, but know that Satan fears your prayers. Instead of condemning yourself with, how could I think such a thought? Treat it as a distraction from Satan and immediately refocus on God. So, that's the, that's the message. Be constantly aware of the fact that you are going to be tempted constantly. The minute you morally prepare yourself to be acting and behaving for God's will. Re recognize your pattern of, of temptation and be prepared for it. So now he's beginning to guide us on how to recognize when Satan gets a really strong hold on our lives. He said there are certain situations that make you more vulnerable to temptation than others. He said some circumstances will make you stumble almost immediately while others don't bother you that much. These situations are unique to you and you need to identify them before Satan surely knows. He, he knows exactly what trips you up. And he's constantly working to get you into those circumstances. So now you begin to create, understand the pattern by which this thing works. He said, Peter wants, stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. And say, uh, Peter is a good one to talk. Because you remember when uh, Jesus was being taken and, and, and Jesus told Peter that before the cock crossed through three times you would have um, uh, uh, denied me three times and, and Peter was like now you're joking I would never do that and it actually did happen so he now rea he realized what had happened and he felt so remorseful and everything so he knows that these things really do happen so ask yourself when am I most tempted what day of the week am I most tempted what time of the day am I most tempted ask where am I most tempted at work, at home, at a neighbor's house, at a sports bar, in an airport or a motel or out of town. So these are the these are the things you need to start creating your pattern. Start understanding how this thing works in your life. Ask who is with me when I'm most tempted. Friends, co-workers, a crowd of strangers when I'm alone. Also ask how do I usually feel when I'm most tempted. It may be when you are tired or lonely or bored or depressed or under stress. So, this is the pattern is beginning to create for you to understand how this thing happens. Is it when you're lonely, when you're all by yourself, that these voices come to your head? Is it when you're with a lot of people and they're trying, you know, sometimes, especially when people tend to follow crowd, especially for young teenage boys, it's usually in that crowd when all of them are doing the same thing that even the most, the most humble, the most normal, the most quiet, will suddenly become some new evil that everyone will be shocked. I would never have imagined that boy could do that. But he could do that because he was in a crowd. So he wants us to start understanding how this thing works. What creates this pattern for us? It may be when you've been hurt or angry or worried or after a big success or spiritual high. So this thing could be coming to us when we are angry, when we are upset or when we are extremely happy. That's when he wants to attack us. You should identify your typical pattern of temptation and then prepare to avoid those situations as much as possible. The Bible tells us repeatedly to anticipate and be ready to face temptation. And Paul said, don't give the devil a chance. Wise planning reduces temptation. Follow the advice of Proverbs. So plan carefully what you do. Avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Don't go one step off the right way. Don't. Um, God's people avoid evil ways and they protect themselves by watching where they go. So, all these patterns is created for us. Is it when we're with friends? Is it when we're alone? Is it when we're traveling? Is it when we're at home? Is it when we're at work? So, all of these scenarios, we need to look at it. We need to look at it. When do we feel quickly tempted and when do we fall prey to temptation? These are the things we need to be watching out for. And so we should be one step ahead of, of Satan. And we should avoid his ways. So the next one, it says, we should request for God's help constantly. He said, heaven has a 24-hour emergency hotline. God wants you to ask him for assistance in overcoming temptation. 
Again, you remember the Bible, the, the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from evil. We, you know, we, we need to tell God all the time to help us overcome temptation because it is there. It is bound to be there. It is there constantly and we have to be stronger than it. He says, call on me in times of trouble. I will rescue you and you will honor me. So once these troubled times are coming, we should know and we should quickly call on him to come and help us. He calls this a microwave, a microwave prayer, because it works quickly and to the point. Help, SOS, Mayday. When temptation strikes, you don't have time for a long conversation with God. You simply cry out. Help. David, Peter, Paul, and millions of others have prayed this kind of instant prayer for help in times of trouble. So when you find yourself being stuck in that situation, quickly cry out to God to help. Bible guarantees that our cry for help will be heard because Jesus is sympathetic to our struggle. He, he faced the same temptations we do. Jesus went through it. He understands our weaknesses. For he, he faced all of the same temptations we do. Yet he did not sin. Jesus went through all these temptations. Several times in the Bible we were told how the devil kept coming and telling him, Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And he overcame all of them. So if God is waiting to help us um, defeat temptation, why don't we turn to him more often? Honestly, sometimes we don't want to be helped. So as humans, most times we don't want to be helped. We rather just sink. We want to give in to temptation, even though we know it's wrong. So when we know we've been given that shortcut, we know it's wrong. When we have those lustful eyes and we're beginning to fall deeper and deeper into that relationship, we know it's wrong. There's a voice telling us that what we're doing is wrong, but we choose to fall into it. At that moment, we think we know what's best for us more than God does. So we know, but we're still going ahead. We know that God has told us that is wrong, but we still want to do it. At other times, we're embarrassed to ask God for help because we keep giving in to the same temptation over and over. And so, this has become a habit for some people. When they're falling from one temptation and they find out that's their weakness, because it's now telling us we should try and pick out what becomes our weakness. We should try and know those things out are unhealthy for us. We should know the time of the day. We should know the kind of people we're with. We should know what time when how all the things we should know them and once we know them we can then be strong enough to deal with it but now we think we know better than god and so we choose to ignore it but god never gets irritated bored or impatient when we keep coming back to him bible says let us have confidence then and approach god's throne where there is grace there we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. God's love is everlasting and his patience endures forever. If you have to cry for God's help 200 times a day to defeat a particular temptation, he will still be eager to give mercy and grace. So come boldly, ask him for the power to do the right thing and then expect him to provide it. Temptations keep, keep us dependent upon God, just as the roots grow stronger when wind blows against a tree. So every time you stand up to a temptation, you become more like Jesus. When you, when you stumble, which you will, it is not fatal. Instead of giving in or giving up, look up to God, expect Him to help you, and remember the reward that is waiting for us. When people are tempted and still come and still continue strong, they should be happy. After they have proved their faith, God will reward them with their life. And so that's the end of this chapter. And so um, it's a big one. We looked at temptation and now we understand what it means and how it affects us. So quickly, let's look at the question and then our meditation. So points to ponder in this chapter was every temptation is an opportunity to do good. So it's about We've been, we've been made to feel this is the way to go, but we know this is the right way to go. And so we resist it. Question, what, what Christ-like character quality? What Christ-like character quality can I develop by defeating the worst, the most common temptation I face? 
So what kind of Christ-like character could we pick up? By defeating the most common temptation that we constantly face. So again, he gave us all the options. So which one do you think is your weakest one? Which one could you pick from Jesus? And then say, that's the one I'm going to really be strong enough to defeat whenever it comes my way. So meditation, God blesses the people who patiently endure testings. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And this is James chapter 1 verse 12. So here is the end of chapter 26, which is day 26. So I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter. And God bless you eternally. Again, thank you so much for being with us and watching.